Okay, uh, good, e good evening. Uh, welcome to this uh, ECE webinar uh, given by uh, Dr. Kaushik Majumdar. Uh, he's a faculty in uh, ECE department here in I IASC, and he has been uh, faculty here since uh, January 2015. And before that, he had completed his PhD uh, from the same department uh, in 2011, and then had worked in uh, semi uh, in Semantech, uh, I guess, until 2014 before he moved back to teach in IASC. And his group works extensively in 2D materials, studying electronic and optoelectronic properties. And, uh, and he's going to talk about some of the interesting work they are doing currently. So with that brief introduction, uh, I'll give, uh, give the uh, thing to Kaushik so that he can give his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Varun. Yeah. So uh, is a slide in full screen mode? Uh, is it uh, visible? Yes, it is visible. Great. So good afternoon, everybody. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. One uh, quick uh, thing for the attendees. So if you have any questions, please post it in the chat box so that we'll take all the questions at the end of uh, Kaushik's presentation. Right. OK, thank you. Sure. So uh, today uh, I'll be talking about uh, the heterogeneous integration uh, using uh, Van der Waals uh, heterojunctions. And uh, I'll show you know a few examples of uh, the stuff that we are doing uh, recently, uh, applying them into multifunctional devices. So, uh, Van der Waals heterojunctions, many of you uh, may already be aware of. It's it's uh, it's a fairly hot topic nowadays, where you can actually integrate uh, arbitrary uh, materials of uh, different uh, lattice constants. And uh, they can be, you know, placed very, very close to each other, especially. So, and you know, so these are really, you know, in the true sense, uh, atomically sharp junctions. And also, you know, uh, the junctions are very clean. They can be trap-free if you prepare it properly. You can, you know, rotate one layer on top of another layer, so you know, you get another extra degree of freedom. Uh, these things are typically, you know, very difficult to achieve in conventional uh, bulk semiconductors uh, because of the typical uh, growth and, and lattice matching parameters. And also because of the close proximity, you know, you can have very fast uh, charge transfer and energy transfer from one layer to another layer. So here I am showing, you know, a couple of examples. In the in the left, you can see. Uh, uh, the uh, different uh, layers, uh, they are like, you know, tied together through Van der Waals bonding. And, and these are like, you know, really, you know, arbitrary number of layers you can stack on top of uh, another. So these are all, you know, two dimensional layers. However, it doesn't have to be two dimensional layers. For example, in the right hand side, this is something I'll talk about later. Uh, so there is a, a nano wire which is a, uh, again uh, sort of a dangling bond free Van der Waals material. And on top of that, you put, you know, uh, hexagonal boron nitrite, which is a two dimensional layer. So this multidimensional integration is also possible. So uh, what I'm going to do today is sort of use some of these uh, heterojunctions. Uh, and I'll show you that, you know, they can be applied in various uh, uh, applications. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is uh, a an Esaki diode that is built using uh, Van der Waals materials. And the next one I'll talk about uh, that nanoware and 2D uh, material uh, integration to show a, 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 a very uh, high performance uh, junctionless nanoware transistor. And then uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, some optoelectronic effects, a quantum confined Stark effect, where we'll see a strong excitonic effects uh, in QCAC. Uh, that is coming from a monolayer and bilayer. And we'll see, you know, what are the uh, differences uh, in uh, these two types of systems, so that is a monolayer and a bilayer. So the first topic here, uh, so uh, a Van der Waals uh, tunnel diode. As you know, you know, tunnel diodes uh, uh, are very uh, uh, interesting devices where you use typically a uh, heavily doped P and N type material. And usually, if you are in the forward bias, uh, if you do it right, then you can see uh, negative differential resistance. So here we uh, uh, chose uh, two materials. One is uh, a black phosphorus, 
uh, which uh, is, is a multi-layer black phosphorus, which has a uh, valence band uh, maximum at the Z point, and you have uh, SNSE2, which is a heavily doped N-type material, and uh, that has a conduction band uh, minimum at the L point. These two materials uh, themselves form a broken gap type 3 heterojunction. So this should be an ideal candidate for uh, band to band tiling because uh, you know they can be placed you know really close to each other and uh, large you know energy overlap for this tunneling right. We, we made this uh, device so this is you can see uh, there are like you know one two three four five six layers the bottom layer is a metal then uh, there is an uh, uh, SNSE2 and uh, then on top of that uh, you have uh, this uh, WS2 which is something I'll talk about later and then after that you have a black phosphorus layer and then for gating you have uh, an insulating HBN layer and on top of that is a graphene gate. Okay. So this is how it looks like in an optical image once you fabricate the device. So uh, when we measure this, just the black phosphorus and SNSE2 uh, heterojunction, uh, what we observe is a, a high current, uh, but it's really a linear characteristics, not that interesting. Uh, you can understand, you know, from this uh, band diagram that this has to be a band to band tunneling. However, there is no negative differential resistance that we observe here. However, when we uh, introduce a monolayer WS2 in the junction, we observe, you know, beautiful uh, negative differential resistance characteristics uh, with a very respectable uh, uh, peak to valley current ratio of 3.6. So uh, what's really happening is if we go back here, uh, so it's, it's important that, you know, there is some drop that happens in uh, a depletion layer, typically in a, in a lateral PN junction uh, diode uh, to have the Fermil, the, the quasi Fermi level at the P side and the N side to move with respect to each other. However, if we just snap them together with hardly any depletion layer on top of uh, 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 any depletion layer, then what happens is, you know, the Fermi level is almost pinned from the left and the right side. And so uh, you don't really see the, uh, uh, the separation between the left and right side uh, Fermi levels. And that makes it, you know, almost pinned and, you know, no uh, PVCR. However, when you introduce this monolayer WS2, we forcefully you know, introduce this layer to have a drop across it. So it's something like this now. And then you, know, you start seeing these you know, PVCR characteristics. Um, so these are the different regions. Uh, uh, so for example, you know, when uh, you start from zero uh, voltage uh, and then you increase uh, the voltage in the forward bias mode uh, and start measuring the current, what happens is that uh, there's a band-to-band -band tunneling that happens from this uh, uh, degenerately doped SNSE2 to this, you know, empty states in black phosphorus. Uh, and it's uh, as you, you know, sort of increase the uh, voltage. Uh, so there is some peak that happens, which is somewhere here. And then after that, what happens is uh, because of the reduction in the overlap of these bands, uh, the current starts dropping. And this is a very interesting region. I'll talk about this later, which is uh, which makes this region you know unstable because here, if you increase the voltage, the current actually goes down. And eventually, you get a situation where you know there is no overlap, and in principle, there should be zero current there. However, for uh, uh, the reasons why you know the current doesn't exactly go to zero, and we get a ratio which is an important parameter, which is about uh, 3.6. And then after that, of course, the uh, 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 the uh, thermionic current, you know, takes over, and you see a normal uh, forward bias uh, PN junction current. This is the uh, temperature characteristics. Uh, again, you know, this these are you know very robust. Uh, every time we introduce the WS2 layer, we observe this with 100% uh, yield. Uh, I think we repeated on about six or seven devices. Um, so what happens is that you know you get this you know uh, PVCR characteristics as we uh, reduce the current, uh, the peak current uh, sort of you know uh, goes down a little bit, but the valley current you know does go down you know quite strongly. So there is an improvement in the peak to valley current ratio. So at room temperature it was 3.6, at uh, low temperature at 7 Kelvin uh, we have obtained a value of about 4.6. 
which is again, you know, uh, very, very respectable numbers. The another uh, point to mention here is uh, this, uh, char this characteristic, these characteristics are very clean and robust, which is something we usually do not find in two dimensional materials because of uh, the uh, lack of, uh, you know, uh, you know, strong tiling probability and also the robustness of these uh, heterojunctions. So this is uh, one important achievement, you know, in this uh, uh, area. Uh, another thing is I uh, mentioned that you know at low temperature you expect that if if the valley current is really dominated by thermionic uh, uh, nature then you should expect a very strong suppression in the valley current uh, at low temperature. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And uh, when we see that you know it, it's it's strongly you know uh, non-thermionic in nature, and uh, this is a common problem in uh, tunnel diodes. Usually, what happens is you know the current is not dominated by the thermionic part, but really the uh, excess current uh, because of these gap states. So it appears that we know that you know SNS2 uh, our SNS2 is not perfect. So there are gap states, and because of that, you know this tunneling can happen. And uh, so that's uh, so if we can improve the quality of these uh, uh, crystals, uh, I believe that you know it, this can go down. Uh, go, uh, the valley current can go down quite significantly. Okay, so now, uh, so about the gate control. So this is one of the uh, beautiful things about these, you know, ventral wall central junctions because you can, they are so thin, you can actually, you know, uh, make uh, gate control uh, in a pretty easy manner, which is usually not a very trivial job, you know, for the bulk semiconductor uh, materials. So here, for example, when we had a thin uh, black phosphorus and I had a gate on top, so I'm getting from this side. So what happens is that you know I'm able to change the doping in uh, black phosphorus, and if I do that, I see that there is a suppression in the peak current density, right? So which is uh, what is expected because the tunneling efficiency is going down. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not the tunneling efficiency, but rather the uh, the overlap uh, between the uh, the conduction band and the balance band side, right? So the peak current goes down. That's expected. However, when you use a thick BP. We see that you know there is no change in the uh, uh, peak current, and that's expected because this is uh, thick B, black phosphorus. So if I gate from top side, so the the junction area really uh, isn't uh, being gated. So it, it remains it's, it maintains its doping uh, as it was at zero gate voltage, and so the uh, tunneling really does not change much. But what we observe is that there is a uh, in, an interesting effect of the shift in uh, the uh, peak current position. So note that the peak current position shifted here as well. And this is quite easily understood because as we are you know, gating, what happens is that uh, the uh, series resistance in the collect current collection path, that is actually changing. And if the series resistance increases, then to have to match the peak current condition, you need to apply larger voltage. So this is a fairly well understood uh, uh, problem in tunnel diode literature. And so your you know, uh, peak current density, uh, peak current position actually uh, shifts. On the other hand here, what we observe in the, in the thick case, the peak current uh, position does move up, but then after certain uh, doping, it actually goes down. So what we believe is happening is that, you know, so initially it was like this and then, you know, uh, it, it is sort of going up because you are uh, reducing the doping. But as you increase the doping significantly, you know, uh, let's say a positive gate voltage, you are actually making this a bilayer in the BP itself. So this was P-type, you are not doing anything, but this side is becoming N-type. So it's, it's, it's sort of, there is another band-to-band -band tiling that starts happening here, which is why, you know, uh, the peak current actually, you know, uh, position moves backward. All right, so now, uh, so we try to, you know, use this because the uh, characteristics were so clean and uh, so robust, we try to apply this to a couple of applications. So one of the application is a, a voltage controlled oscillator. So here what happens is suppose you measure this uh, uh, current as a function of voltage in a, in a fairly slow manner, let's say in a, in, a, in a really DC manner, what happens is that you, you get this blue line. However, if you reduce the voltage step and starts uh, uh, doing it in a fast sweep, you start seeing these oscillations. And these oscillations uh, are uh, expected because 
when I so in this region, it's actually an astable mode. See, if I if I plot the power delivered to the system, which is I times V versus the voltage, what I see is that in the blue shaded, sorry, the gray shaded region, I I have a a, a power value uh, for a for a for a uh, uh, let's say uh, for a given uh, power value, I have two voltages that are uh, possible, right? So uh, both of them are allowed. So it can actually, you know, uh, move back and forth between these two states. And if it does, you know, it's really an astable operation and you, you will get an oscillation out of this. So we, we, we try to do this, you know, using an oscilloscope. So basically, you know, uh, you, you drive the uh, tunnel diode with a given voltage uh, is a DC bias and uh, just keep measuring the uh, uh, oscilloscope uh, uh, voltage across this. So this was done in a uh, in a DC probe station. So with a large relatively large parasitic capacitance, which is why you know we couldn't achieve a very high frequency, but still you know it was very nicely voltage controlled and we are uh, achieving about uh, a kilohertz or something uh, fairly, fairly robust oscillations. So uh, th th this is something we are working on for currently you know uh, just you know uh, change the setup and you know uh, uh, get the oscillation frequency uh, uh, much higher. Of course, for that you also need to improve the uh, uh, the peak current as well. Okay. The other uh, uh, interesting thing that you can think about here is uh, instead of applying uh, uh, voltage and measure uh, current, let's say I force the current and keep measuring the voltage. Uh, so what happens is, let's say, so this was the orange one was my NDR. I'm, I'm just you know. Uh, drawing in a transposed manner. So this is my VD and this is my ID. So the orange curve was the NDR. Now let's say I force the voltage and keep measuring the current. Uh, I'm sorry, force current and keep measuring the voltage. So I, 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 I keep doing this and it, it stays here. Now right here, if I increase the current further, there is no other possibility that the, the system has to jump to this state, right? And then uh, it follows this path. However, while coming back, if I if I trace back, it does not come back here because now this is a metastable state. There is an energy barrier that is created. It's a, it's a double potential well kind of energy barrier, and so it it comes traces this path, and then after that, from here it comes back uh, because there is no other state available uh, to this state. So this region can actually be used as a uh, volatile memory. Volatile because you know as long as the power remains, this remains in this state. So we uh, used this, uh, and it was also, you know, nicely voltage uh, gate voltage controllable. Uh, the memory window could be controlled. Uh, so this is uh, kind of very interesting because you, if you think about it, this is really a, a, a cross bar switch uh, where you can uh, implement a random access memory, and it's a very very small footprint, uh, much smaller than a 60 SRAM uh, uh, cell. Uh, also, you know, you can actually have, you know, a possible 3D integration. So there is a possibility for, you know, very high density uh, integration uh, of, uh, here. So that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, let me move to the uh, next uh, topic, uh, which were uh, so we are going to introduce uh, this uh, nanowares. Uh, so these are these are tellurium nanowares, very interesting material. Uh, so uh, Ravi from MRC he grows these beautiful materials. So these are uh, helical nanowares, uh, and there is no dangling bond uh, that is uh, protruding out. Uh, very high carrier mobility, so very interesting material for channel. Uh, however, the band gap is relatively small, so it's it's little tricky to turn off these uh, nanowires. Otherwise, they are you know, very highly conducting. So uh, again, thanks to Ravi for all these you know uh, beautiful images, and they are also well characterized through Raman and these you know imaging and all. So uh, what we were uh, uh, trying to address here? Okay, fine. This is very uh, high mobility material. So can we get a, a structure? Uh, which uh, where we can turn it off in a very efficient manner. Usually, you know, there are uh, uh, you know uh, very few reports in tellurium-based uh, uh, you know uh, field effect transistors, uh, both uh, nanoware as well as you know lateral uh, like you know two-dimensional flakes. The problem is the same everywhere. 
if you thin it down you're uh, you are able to turn it off uh, get good on off ratio but your mobility degrades on the other hand if you are using you know thicker or larger diameter material then your mobility is extremely good but you are not able to turn off your on off ratio can go down to like you know 100 uh, 10 or something so this is a challenge and we said okay fine so what about you know trying to improve the electrostatics because this is already a nano weld should have a very good electrostatics because of its you know cylindrical nature and on top of that you know let's just you know introduce a double gated structure and let's see you know what kind of uh, on off ratio versus you know mobility that we are achieving so we tried to do that so you can see you know the quickly the fabrication steps so we use a, a back gated uh, uh, so this is silicon uh, dioxide and back side is silicon so this can be used as a back gate then you on top of that you know you sort of transfer these you know solution processed uh, nanowires then we do some you know argon plasma cleaning uh, this is to you know get rid of these residues i'll i'll uh, uh, show in the next slide and then after that this is the 2d integration so we just introduce a, an hbn layer as the top gate dielectric and then after that you you, you do a litho for this you know gate and uh, contacts and then do another plasma cleaning to get rid of any of these you know uh, uh, remaining residues and put you know metal contacts through lift off okay so uh, this plasma cleaning step is by the way very important because when you uh, grow this you know this is how it looks like if you clean this then it looks like this so the current also you can see is like a kind of uh, nanoamps or something however if you clean this this goes to like 1000 times comes to microamp so that's that that's a very you know critical step so now uh, so this is how we made it this is uh, uh, you know top view acm of you know one of these uh, devices that we made uh, so you can see that if i just use uh, the uh, the back gate then so this is my uh, drain current versus back gate voltage so it, it's it's very difficult to turn it off so it's, it's more or less remains here and then you know slowly comes down so it's about uh, you know 10 or something on off ratio on the other hand if i use just the top gate which is uh, significantly better uh, it does turn off uh, but then your uh, on current is really really poor so if i turn on both the gates together then i actually sweep from here to here and this is what you can see from here so in 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 the top gate i am basically sweeping along this line in the back gate i am sweeping along this line but in the both gates uh, on and i am actually sweeping across the diagonal and i am able to get a, a very good on off ratio about 10 uh, i think about 20000 or something and also the uh, on current is maintained Okay, so that's something we really wanted to achieve, so which was uh, very interesting. Uh, also, another interesting thing is that you know you can actually uh, move this mode from, uh, uh, let's say, a Schottky barrier fed mode to a MOSFET mode just by you know changing the uh, backgate voltage. So this is this is a backgate voltage of you know 30 volts, which basically turns off this P-type material, and then uh, these portions, and then you turn on uh, with the top gate. You, you see a you know short key barrier like nature on the other hand if you turn on these you know lateral parts by moving a, a negative gate voltage uh, and then you know you swap uh, sweep this you know top gate voltage you get more like a you know uh, mosfet like behavior okay. another very interesting uh, property here uh, so this is uh, by the way I, i just mentioned you that this is acting as a junctionless transistor by junctionless transistor i mean that you know this is an already you know uh, highly conducting nanowire and then what you do is uh, so it's normally on you apply a uh, gate voltage from top and back and you turn off uh, deplete carriers and uh, you know reduce the current advantage of this is that you don't need to do you know very steep you know source and drain uh, uh, implantation so which is very very critical you know if you scale down your transistor to you know let's say sub 10 nanometers or something so scalability is expected to be much better uh, for junctionless transistors okay uh, so so here uh, the because you are not you know uh, separately doping it you know uh, so it's important that you get you know a very low short key barrier height otherwise you know your contact resistance is going to be really large so this is one interesting thing about uh, this material uh, so it appears that you know if i use a high work function metal 
the short key period actually pins uh, you know inside the balance band so when you measure this you know iv characteristics at low uh, temperature let's say it's about you know 5 kelvin uh, to let's say i go uh, up to 270 kelvin the uh, this portion is not really changing much what it means is that your uh, uh, short key barrier uh, is really negligible there we are able to turn off with almost you know uh, barrier free uh, in a, in a barrier free manner and this is also clear from this you know uh, this you know richardson plots and all so it's, it, you you hardly get you know really any any barrier uh, at at the metal uh, nanowire interface so that was uh, one very interesting news uh the other part is the mobility so we try to extract the mobility so again mobility extraction is a bit non trivial here because of the geometry uh so you first need to accurately extract the capacitance which we did uh, through a finite element method uh, uh, and sort of basically solved the maxwell's equations and once we do that you know you you get uh, the uh, uh, capacitance values and then from there you you find out uh, from the iv characteristics the uh, mobility as a function of gate voltage if we look at the peak mobility uh, we get you know uh, 1390 cm square per volt second at 5 kelvin at 270 kelvin it's 570 cm square per volt second so it is is again you know very very impressive number uh, Uh, it it easily beats both silicon and germanium you know uh, whole mobilities uh, and also uh, if you look it as a function of temperature it sort of you know flattens out here which shows that you know uh, this portion is uh, uh, as a function of temperature so it looks like uh, some coulomb driven processes however at higher temperature it goes as steep or minus 1.1.4 5 or something so this is sort of the uh, phonon limited uh, portion Okay. so uh, so you you eventually get a, a good you know high mobility uh, barrier free injection and a fairly good gate control through the double gate okay so uh, we also wanted to quickly check uh, the performance of this finally so uh, again you know this is what i was trying to tell you earlier with all the reports that we have uh, till date uh, if you increase the thickness of the 2d uh, tellurium or the nanowire diameter the on off ratio uh, really degrades you are losing the gate control here however if you thin it down so these portions good on off ratio but then your mobility is degraded so these are all really you know low performance uh, transistors so using this double gate we are actually somewhere here so we are still working with about you know 40 to 50 uh, nanometer diameter uh, nano uh, 40 to 50 nanometer uh, diameter nanometer diameter uh, however we are also able to achieve you know a, a, a very good you know on off ratio in terms of the uh, scaled current also because we are not degrading the mobility our performance in terms of you know drive current is still pretty good uh, while again maintaining this on off ratio so that was uh, a good uh, lesson to learn uh, from this exercise okay so um, fine so now uh, let me uh, sort of uh, uh, move ahead with you know a couple of structures where we would be uh, uh, talking about some uh, optoelectronic effects so uh, so I'll, i'll talk about this you know quantum confined uh, stark effect uh, uh, qcsc and i'll uh, discuss this in two different uh, so similar experiments but you know two different uh, materials in one case we have a, a monolayer a transition metal dichalcogenides uh, and in other case we have a bilayer and there is a, a particular difference between this monolayer and bilayer in terms of symmetry uh, so first of all you know all these uh, monolayers and bilayers the optoelectronic properties are significantly uh, governed by uh, excitons and excitons are really strong in these uh, materials that is because uh, these are very very thin like a monolayer when i say it's about you know 7 angstrom thick a bilayer would be about you know 1.4 uh, nanometer thick so that's very thin so your uh, electrons and holes uh, which are excited you know in a 
uh, under let's say uh, light illumination or something. So th they are very close to each other spatially. So secondly, you know the the dielectric constant of these materials are also you know relatively less compared to, for example, you know three five like allium arsenide or something. And also they are like you know fairly heavy effective mass uh, particles. So what happens is eventually they cannot run away for, from each other you know very easily. So that makes the uh, binding energy of these excitons you know very strong. I mean on the order of 500 milli electron volt, uh, which is really large. You know if you compare with respect to let's say gallium arsenide, that's about five milli electron volt. So these excitons, you know, can be described using uh, a coherent uh, uh, transitions uh, between these, you know, uh, conduction band and valence band states, uh, so say two particle in a two particle Hamiltonian. So what we first try to see is, okay, so quantum confined Stark effect. So what happens is, so Stark effect is a, a, a very, you know, widely used material for in optoelectronic devices where you apply an electric field and you try to see you know whether uh, there is a movement in the emission line or uh, 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 of the uh, material or not right and and now you know uh, in in case of you know quantum confined stark effect you know you you can sort of you know move from a uh, bulk material to a quantum confined structure the advantage here is that in a bulk material uh, if you apply a large field, the electron and hole will basically, you know, uh, run away from each other. And so, you know, uh, your uh, the oscillator strength can go down very significantly. However, in a quantum confined structure, you still apply the field. However, you are still forcing the electron and hole to stay close to each other through the geometric confinement. And because of this, uh, so you should be able to apply a much larger field without, you know, degrading the oscillator strength. So what we wanted to uh, see here is in the case of a monolayer, uh, can we actually observe some strong excitonic effects? So to do that, you know, we uh, made this step again. So this is like a, a monolayer WS2, which is encapsulated by HBN. And then we use two gates. So one is in you know, a top graphene gate, uh, graphene because we wanted to have some uh, transparent electrode. So the light can come out of this. And at the bottom, you know, we have gold, uh, which is another electrode and the gold also helps to some extent in, in reflecting the light, uh, uh, seeing the, so the uh, signal can be a little stronger. Okay. So this is how it looks like uh, in the optical image. Uh, okay, so if we do not anneal this structure, just, you know, uh, measure it. Uh, what we observe is that the, the position, the exciton position, actually is shows a parabolic shift with respect to zero electric field and this is something which has been fairly widely reported uh, in literature and uh, by the way this parabolic shift has something to do with the symmetry of the problem uh, because this is a, a monolayer in a monolayer you break the inversion symmetry but uh, you maintain your reflection symmetry across z equal to zero so across let's say for example the tungsten uh, atom because of this symmetry, what uh, the reflection symmetry, what happens is that the first order uh, component of the Stark effect that goes to zero, and what you see is really the second order uh, one, which uh, is parabolic in nature, right? So this is uh, what we see, and this uh, matches well with uh, literature. However, if we anneal the structure, then we see something very interesting. So it, it maintains a parabolic structure, uh, in the shift. However, uh, around uh, this uh, zero electric field, there is a dip. And this dip is very prominent and it repeats over every sample that we anneal. Okay. So obviously, you know, it's very clear that uh, there is some compensation effect that is happening. So this parabolic thing is again, you know, it's quite well understood uh, because of uh, the change in the band gap. However, here there must be something else is happening and what we feel here is that there is an electron and a hole and because you're applying a vertical field, they're actually, you know, pulled apart from each other. So the binding energy of uh, the exciton is actually going down. So we, we try to, you know, 
calculate the binding edge from here. So let's say we subtract this from the, this, you know, field equal to zero, and what we get is a linear uh, shift. So the binding energy, uh, let's say it's uh, the change in the binding energy, it's sort of zero here. As as we increase uh, the field, the binding energy is actually going down. Because the binding edge is going down, there is a blue shift in the excitonic emission, and we observe, you know, this sort of, you know, peak. So note that, you know, in this region, the band gap effect is uh, negligible because this is parabolic, so no, not much of a change. However, this effect is linear, so it basically there's a blue shift that starts dominating. However, as we increase uh, this uh, field further, then uh, both of them are uh, acting, and it's the parabolic effect that eventually uh, dominates and it makes it uh, strongly parabolic. Also, you know, uh, note that the total change in binding energy that we estimated is about 10 MeV, while the absolute binding energy is still 500 MeV. So what we are really changing is only about, you know, one to two percent, not more than that. And that's uh, that makes sense because, you know, it's, it's really it's still very strongly confined uh, through this HPN layers. So one of the question is like, you know, why, you know, annealing actually uh, helps this. Uh, what we believe is that you know this uh, band offset with HBN is relatively less uh, compared to let's say if you have let's say air or something, and because of this, you know it actually helps to spread the you know wave function uh, a little bit you know away from each other. So that's that's what our current understanding is. I should also say that you know the intensity of the exciton does not change as a function of electric field much unless you know we, we are at very high field. So this is not a doping effect, which is you know uh, important to note. Otherwise, you know if it converts to trion, then the oscillator strength can go down and it can have some you know uh, doping induced shifts uh, because of you know many body physics. So, so that's that's uh, looks like that's not uh, really happening. It's it's really flat uh, exciton, and we. We don't see any trion there in this. Uh, I mean, we do see the trion, but that is also like kind of flat intensity. So it does not modulate the intensity of the trion. So we try to model this also. You know, so of course, you know, we, we solve uh, uh, bethes helpeter equation. That's how this two diamond, uh, two particle Hamiltonian is solved. Uh, the exchange interaction uh, we keep it as zero because we are talking about q equal to zero excitons, and the direct term is modeled uh, uh, through this, you know, uh, Coulomb interaction. And here. We actually, in this uh, Z naught parameter, we sort of you know model this uh, shift, uh, spatial shift from the electron and hole, and it looks like you know it it it, it very nicely you know uh, models uh, uh, the data. Uh, I mean, it fits the data. If I put Z naught equal to zero, so there is no shift, then it basically comes back to the standard you know parabolic effect. So uh, looks like you know this model is uh, working well here. Uh, so another uh, point here is that it's not just for exciton. This seems to be a very uh, a generic uh, 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 technique uh, for all the excitonic complexes that we observe. So I, I'll show you trion, bi exciton, uh, defect bound exciton for all these per, uh, core complexes. You know, uh, this is more or less it is valid. So, for example, in a trion, what happens is that you know, as F, uh, field equal to zero is here, but as you know, there's a finite field, you know, they are kind of polarized, and so the binding energy uh, sort of is reduced. And here also, you know, we could uh, we could model it uh, with uh, the trion Hamiltonian uh, in the uh, modified bethes helpeter equation. So that also worked well. Uh, of course, the fit is not as good as the exciton, and this is because uh, of the uh, complexity of the numerical calculation, the size of the matrices, it really increases very significantly. So it becomes uh, difficult to uh, do it in a uh, in a reasonable time frame. Uh, also, you know, uh, the trion binding energy can be very clearly observed here. This is what I was trying to tell earlier that the trion peak intensity also does not change; it remains flat. So it's not really a doping effect. However, you know, we could see a a, a change in the trion binding energy. Uh, which is actually you know uh, going going down and and that sort of you know so it's basically exciton minus uh, trion uh, peak position uh, again you know if we don't annihilate we see a, a conventional uh, parabolic stark effect for the trion as well and uh, the binding energy change that time is really negligible it's just flat 
So it, is, it really looks like, you know, it's, it's a binding energy effect. Uh, again, you know, we, we observe this for biexitons as well. So biexiton, you know, the power law, it goes as, you know, P squared. That's how we, we uh, identify this as a biexiton. And we, we, we measure this, you know, it again goes beautiful, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, dip at the center and it goes up. Uh, and again, the biaxiton intensity is again, you know, flat. It does not change. So there is really uh, uh, not uh, a, a doping effect here. Uh, we, by the way, when I say biaxiton, it's really not the truly biaxiton. It's really the five particle system. That's why I'm writing is XX minus. Uh, so it's like, you know, uh, three electrons and two hole a five particle system. Yeah. And finally, you know, uh, these defect bound excitons, interestingly, they also show, uh, uh, you know, very nice uh, effect, a similar effect. The only difference is that the effect is much stronger here. Looks like, you know, because, you know, uh, these uh, states you can modulate, you know, very significantly uh, because of uh, their weak binding with the uh, defect states and all. Particularly if you look at the total modulation level the, in the Stark effect, that's really large. So that's another, you know, uh, interesting aspect. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like, you know, this uh, quantum confined Stark effect, you know, can have a very strong excitonic effects, uh, basically modulation of the binding energy apart from the band gap change. And that can, uh, uh, you know, sort of make things fairly complicated, but at, at the same time, you know, nicely, you know, tunable as well. I mean, you can, you can actually move up and then uh, then then come down i mean it's, it's really up to you how you want to design your system so that really uh, adds uh, 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 sort of value to uh, these uh, effects okay okay so this is uh, the uh, final thing that i have which is uh, a uh, quantum confined stark effect but in a in a bilayer system Bilayer is a, a very interesting system uh, where you basically have two layers. Uh, this is, these are natural bilayers. So where one layer is uh, rotated by 180 degree with respect to another. And uh, so you, you basically create, you know, almost degenerate states uh, because of, you know, these uh, layer induced effects. And uh, these uh, excitonic states, they, you know, this is uh, from our previous study. We have seen that, you know, they uh, have very uh, interesting, you know, uh, layer distributions. So you can you can really see, like, you know, which type of exciton is distributed in which layer and all these things. So you can have both intra-layer excitons as well as inter-layer excitons. And these are all, by the way, you know, uh, Q equal to zero excitons, so the direct excitons. What we also uh, calculated earlier is that the intralayer exciton uh, oscillator strength is at least one order of magnitude higher than this interlayer exciton, which is why all the optoelectronic properties that we observe is driven by uh, the intralayer exciton. So, uh, so this is just you know one simple uh, bilayer. You know, if you just do the reflection uh, spectroscopy, you know, at uh, different temperatures, you can see very beautiful you know movement uh, of the exciton equation as a function of temperature, and the oscillator strength of course goes down you know as we increase the temperature. So this is this is uh, well characterized, uh, and uh, here what we uh, see is the uh, the K space distribution of these excitons. So this is when I say C1, V2. Uh, so this is basically the conduction band is coming from layer one and the valence uh, band is coming from layer two. And so this is why there's an inter-layer exciton, while this one is uh, the C2, V2, which is both of them are coming from the same layer. This is an intra-layer exciton. So this is how, this is how we uh, distinguish uh, whether it is an intra-layer versus it is an inter-layer and all. Okay. So we will come back to this uh, later in analyzing the data. Okay. Now, particularly to the uh, QCSE, so there is a beautiful difference between a monolayer and a bilayer. In a monolayer, 1H structure, as I mentioned earlier, so you break the inversion symmetry. So there is no center of inversion in this uh, system. However, you have a reflection symmetry across this line, right? You, you just flip back and it sort of you get to this point. In a bilayer, it's exactly opposite. So there is a uh, 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 a center of inversion symmetry. However, 
the recession symmetry is broken. So the center of investment symmetry plays a very important role uh, when it comes to uh, degeneracy and you know value physics. However, uh, in the QCSE, uh, this reflection symmetry you know plays a more important role. In particular, since now you know we are breaking the reflection symmetry in the bilayer. So earlier, if you recall, uh, we we had the reflection symmetry, and so the first the first order term uh, of uh, went to zero. But here, the first order term will start uh, you know uh, contributing. So what we uh, expect uh, from the calculation that it's a linear QCSE as opposed to a parabolic QCSE in monolayer. So in bilayer, we should expect linear quantum confidence start effect. Okay. So uh, what we wanted to see if, uh, is, you know, uh, can we actually observe that? Okay. And uh, I should note here that we are really uh, primarily talking about this intralayer excitons, and this is a bilayer WS2. It turns out that the interlayer exciton oscillator strength is really, really weak. Uh, I don't think till now there has been any experimental uh, observation of this interlayer exciton in bilayer, in the natural bilayer of WS2. It has been observed in MOS2, MOSE2, but not in WS2. So, so what we are observing uh, is really the intralayer exciton and see what happens to its manipulation. So this is the stack that we have. It's basically a bilayer which is with you know HPN encapsulated, uh, and then you have a top graphene layer. Uh, which is contacted to metal and there's a bottom graphene layer uh, as another metal and you apply a gate voltage between the two and initially there's another electrode here we keep it open so we really talk about the field effect here what happens if i don't dope it if i apply a voltage here then we'll start doping it but there is no carrier injection that is happening in this layer but we are just you know applying an electric field okay so what we observe yes we do observe a very clean, you know, uh, linear uh, quantum confined stark effect, uh, which was very exciting to see. And however, if we go to higher electric field, we see that this linear quantum confined stark effect starts, you know, sort of either saturating or sort of deviating from linearity. And this makes sense because at high electric field, there are multiple uh, excitonic effects, you know, that will start playing a role. So for example, one of the effects we just discussed is that there could be a relative blue shift because of the electron and hole are sort of pulled apart from each other. So that can reduce the binding energy and uh, provide a relative blue shift that uh, can uh, do this. There could be another effect, which is if the electron and holes are polarized, all the electrons are closed by and the holes are closed by, they will start the exciton, exciton repulsion will start playing a role and that can also play uh, uh, a role here. So these uh, could be some of the effects where we are deviating from linearity at, at high electric fields. Uh, another thing is if I look at the oscillator strength, it dramatically goes down. Like, so when we have like you know zero electric field, is a strong oscillator strength. As we keep on increase electric field on both sides, it just goes down. So that that makes it very very interesting uh, for optoelectronic applications because you know you are really uh, talking about a system where you apply electric field and you modulate the reflectivity of that material, and and the modulation is very strong. It almost goes to zero uh, at high electric field. So we are trying to understand you know, why this is the case, and it again you know comes from this uh, these calculations. So what happens is when you have uh, let's say zero electric field, uh, we are talking about this uh, intralayer exciton. So let's say the uh, hole and the electron both are in the same layer, and now as we keep on increasing the electric field, what we observe is that from the center of uh, the K space, so K capital K, let's say. Uh, you start seeing that there is an uh, so movement of uh, the hole from that center of the K space and just starts moving into the other layer. And the opposite thing happens for uh, the layer two. Okay, uh, so it sort of uh, tells you is that there is a partial change from intralayer exciton to an interlayer exciton. And we should note here that this, although these portions, uh, not no change is happening, the change is happening only at you know the central point. But it is the central point which plays most important role in the exciton because that's really the uh, the region where the excitonic strength is strong, which you can see from this right hand side plot. So this is this is really where uh, the exciton contribution is coming from. 
and so because of this there's an uh, intralayer to quasi interlayer sort of uh, change and we know from our calculation uh, that uh, if it is becoming interlayer your oscillator strain is going to go down very significantly which is why uh, we believe that you know we are observing this kind of uh, change uh, there is another structure we wanted to see, which is not exactly uh, a stark effect, but let's say what happens if we dope the system. So there is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, and uh, this one now we keep it open and we apply a voltage with respect to this electrode, which is connected to the bilayer. So as we increase the doping, what we observe is that uh, so initially at low voltage we see strong exciton but there is really uh, no trion however in both sides for positive voltage and negative voltage as we increase the voltage then your uh, exciton is actually gone all the excitonic oscillator strength is converted into a trion so this is the two holes and one electron and this is the negative trion which is two electrons and one hole it, it, it comes up you know beautifully if we look at the oscillator strength, see the uh, excitonic oscillator strength is going down dramatically as we increase the doping and that is actually getting converted into trion and so the trion oscillator strength is actually increasing as we increase uh, it on both sides. In terms of the position, there is a slight blue shift uh, of the exciton position and this again we believe is just because of uh, a uh, many body physics uh, is uh, it's very small uh, but uh, it's it's possible uh, the trion uh, oscillator so trion binding sorry trion position uh, does go down a little bit uh, and this is actually quite you know uh, well reported earlier also in monolayer where if i look at this you know x not uh, the peak position difference between the exciton and the trion it actually shows a linear shift. So it's, uh, it's about 18 MeV separation here. If I increase uh, the voltage, it goes to about 26 MeV. So this is uh, the difference is really not the uh, trion binding energy, but it's more like the trion dissociation energy. So what happens is that, you know, uh, when you uh, uh, dissociate the trion, uh, there is an electron, uh, let's say uh, we're talking about the X minus, so there is an electron that is left uh, with some recoil energy and uh, as you increase your doping, so so that electron eventually go, uh, has to go back to the conduction band and if you are sort of, you know, increase the doping, it's sort of a Pauli blocking effect where the you know bottom portion of those bands are getting filled and because of that, you know, it, you just need to apply slightly higher uh, energy to free that electron and that increases the uh, trion uh, dissociation energy. However, the trion binding energy I believe is uh, not going to go up. It should actually go down because of, you know, uh, more uh, uh, screening and all. So, uh, so that's, that's all uh, I have. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to conclude here saying that, you know, so this, uh, so we really have an ultimate, you know, atomic scale control uh, uh, from a macroscopic world. So there are so many effects, you know, which are waiting to be explored and applied to uh, device applications. Uh, this is a really an interesting field. Uh, if you want to uh, know, uh, I mean, read more about uh, these works, you know, some of these are uh, already published. Uh, you can, you know, take a look at uh, these papers. And uh, I'd like to, you know, acknowledge, uh, of course, uh, my group members, you know, uh, I'm presenting, you know, on behalf of them. They are really doing the hard work. So, uh, Nitin, Puskar and uh, Sarthak, they are the lead authors in the works that I presented today. And also, you know, thanks to Ravi and his student Devadarshini uh, for the uh, nanoware work uh, for the growth as well as uh, the imaging. And uh, uh, I also thank Kenji and Takashi for uh, their supply of uh, high quality HBN crystals to us. Uh, and also I thank DST, MHRD and ISRO for funding. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kaushik, for a very interesting talk. Uh, so I, I heard there is some issue posting questions in the chat box in uh, Teams, but okay. uh, people have 
posted in uh, YouTube, so I will read those questions. So for the attendees, if there are any urgent questions, I would suggest you post it in YouTube and uh, we will ask that right now. If not, you can also contact Kaushik and ask your questions. Uh, so the first question uh, is in slide number nine, what is the reason for the sudden drop of current at the end of uh, two and then start of three? Yes, so uh, so this is uh, really the uh, astable nature. So this uh, this is uh, a signature of uh, oscillations uh, in the uh, circuit. So what happens is that you know we are uh, measuring very slowly. So whatever you know we are measuring is really the average value. So if you, if you measure it first, for, I mean very quickly, then I showed later, right? So you, you will actually see these oscillations. So this is really the onset of the oscillations and this is the average value. OK, so uh, so that's why it suddenly drops over here as well as uh, suddenly drops over here. So that's what it happens. It's it's a it's a fairly, you know, uh, well known thing in typical uh, SRT tunnel diodes where uh, which are used for uh, I mean the ones which are very clean, uh, which shows like, you know, intrinsic oscillations within itself. Yeah. OK, the next question in uh, slide 15. What is the frequency of the tunnel diode which is achieved? So yeah, so you can see here, you know, we achieved about, you know, uh, I think about 1.4 uh, kilohertz or something. And uh, like I said, you know, this is uh, I think yeah, 1.4 or something. Uh, this is primarily uh, limited by this parasitic capacitance. Uh, uh, the way we are measuring it because we are measuring it in a DC probe station and uh, which has a large uh, capacitance. And also, uh, if you want to improve that, the other way to do it is to improve this peak current. So basically, you have to reduce the RC delay. So C, you have to reduce and you have to reduce R, then you have to basically increase this current. So this is something we are working on currently. Another question, does tellurium also offer anisotropy in 2, 2D like graphene where the axial conductivity is different from the other two? Uh, of course, uh, yes. Uh, so you see that you know the axial conductivity is much higher, but uh, the uh, I mean if you go along the axis, but if you go you know uh, out of plane, then what happens is that these are all Van der Waals uh, material uh, so connected by van der Waals, so really no bond strong bonding as such and uh, that mobility is going to be lower but but i mean we were not too interested in this work in this uh, out of plane conductivity it's more like the axial conductivity that we are interested in along the nano wire and in similar lines like for the tellurium nano wires do they have uh, interesting optical properties as well is that something yes, which they, is explored yes yes they they do have uh, they are very interesting optical properties. Uh, so uh, one uh, it, it does absorb a good amount of light as well. I mean uh, the band gap is on the order of I mean depending on the structure, but it can be order of 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 electron volt. So they can be you know readily used as you know uh, IR detectors as well. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the quantum confined Stark effect you showed, what is the prospect of building optical modulators with that and what kind of bandwidths and performance do you expect out of that? So uh, as you can see the. Uh, so let's say here, so. The the modulation is quite strong. Uh, we. we we could achieve, I think, the detuning of about 4 MeV or something. Uh, if you have a, a really, you know, uh, really, you know, uh, good uh, uh, crystal, the line width uh, of the excitonic emission can go down up to, you know, 2 to 3 MeV in a, in a, in a, at, at low temperature. So you can go uh, beyond uh, your uh, line width. That that's one thing. If you you can improve this further in the uh, other case where you know uh, the other other uh, excitonic species, so it can go up to you know beyond 
10 MeV or something. Bilayer was also, you know, higher than this. So, uh, so looks like, you know, there is a, you know, good tunability beyond your line width. So that's one thing. However, if you ask, you know, can I go to 100 MeV or something? Uh, I would say uh, very difficult for the intralayer excitons. However, it is possible to do for the interlayer excitons because there uh, the modulation is much better. Uh, but then uh, the oscillator strength for the interlayer excitons uh, is of course relatively less. So that's something you know, uh, you know, yeah, people are working on these areas. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So that's all the questions uh, we have right now. So if there are other questions which you uh, wanted to ask and could not post in Teams, uh, so please contact uh, Kaushik directly and he would be happy to answer the questions. So with that, we'll conclude uh, today's webinar and we will thank uh, Kaushik for the very interesting uh, presentation and the results uh, from his group. And I would also like to thank you, the attendees, for attending this uh, seminar and uh, uh, we wish to see you in the next one as well. Thank you very much. Sure, thanks.